This presentation is entitled A Tale of Two Maps, the 1822 and 1840 Fowler Maps of King Swinford. As the title says, it concerns the parish of King Swinford on the western edge of the Black Country and two very detailed maps that were made in the early 19th century that show the development of the parish in very great detail. The material in this presentation can be found in the ebook I have written, King Swinford Manor and Parish, new chapters from the history of King Swinford Staffordshire, and it covers the material in chapters four and five in that book. I'll say a little more about the book at the end of the presentation. But the Fowler maps of King Swinford. The 1822 map was produced for the proprietors of estates within the said parish by the firm of William Fowler Limited in Birmingham at 10 chains to the inch. There were 2,000 numbered properties listed in the book of reference that gave the occupiers, the proprietors, the name of the area or description and the area. A revision was made in 1840 with somewhat less detail in the book of reference and together they make up a rich resource for historical studies of many types. The transcripts of the book of reference are available as spreadsheets. Again, I'll say a little about that at the end of the talk. So if we look at the Fowler map, this is the 1822 map, lots of photographs patched together. It really is a very, very big beast, about a metre and a half by two, two and a half metres. The somewhat infuriating thing about it is that north is not to the top of the map, but rather to the top right hand corner. I suspect that was simply to fit the parish onto a convenient size of, of uh, parchment. So north is to the top right. Uh, and on the maps that follow, I'm going to show as red dots three townships within the parish. The township of King Swinford itself, the ancient industrial township of Wordsley, and the township of Briley Hill. For the maps, for the slides where I show map extracts, I'll stick to the frame of reference used by the map itself with north to the top right. Any other maps I show, I will put north at the top as we would normally expect it to be. So the red dots will reappear on all the forthcoming maps that I will show. If we just look at an extract from the map around King Swinford village itself, one can get an impression of the level of detail that it includes with all the fields, properties numbered. You can see there King Swinford Church, Church of St Mary uh, in the centre, the rectory house close by and perhaps the most striking aspect of the map when you first look at it is a large avenue of trees that seem to point towards King Swinford but if we go to the other end we'll see they go to Shut End, Shut End Hall. It's the avenue of trees for that hall. So if you look at the other at a largest the uh, other end of that avenue it's a very striking feature on the map and there is Shut End Hall. Shut End, by the way, which I'll talk about quite a lot in what follows, simply means a steep place. Um, that's all. If we look at the 1840 map, we can see that um, it's perhaps not so well drawn in many ways. It doesn't look so good, but the differences are very obvious. And in particular, the different major difference we can see in King Swinford is the fact that the King Swinford Railway now runs through it on its way from the Ashwood Basin to the mines in the Corbins Hall area. And there you can see the main line of the King Swinford Railway uh, and the incline that went up where the avenue of trees used to be to Shut End Ironworks, where Shut End Hall used to be. Um, if we look at the book, the book of reference, this is the 1822 book of reference. It's very difficult to see details, but basically it shows the occupiers, the proprietors, 
and name a description and the area of the land. The area is of course given in acres, rods and perches, which if you're not used to it, is not the easiest uh, set of units to use. So it can be appreciated there is a very great deal of information available about the nature of the parish in 1822. And as I said in 1840, although in 1840 the book of reference isn't so detailed and mainly concentrates on the proprietors rather than the occupiers. Okay, let's see first of all what the map can tell us about the topography of the area. And here from now on I'm plotting with north to the top. And I give, if you like, maps that show what is on the Fowler map. It shows watercourses and woods. The uh, parish of King Swinford was largely defined by watercourses, the River Stour in the south, the Smesto Brook in the west, the Hobbage Brook in the north, and the Fens to the east. And you can see the Fens, you can see the various brooks that run through it, in particular the Dawley and the Wordsley Brooks, and the patches of woodland that still existed at the time, Barrow Hill Coppice, Ridgewood, Longswood, Levelwood and Saltwells Wood. The dotted lines, the short dotted lines, show where the parish boundary doesn't follow rivers. And you can see a sort of enclave that is Amblecote between the Stour and the parish boundary in the south of the map. The chain dotted line shows the effect, the extent of the South Staffordshire coal field. And we'll see that's actually quite an important boundary. The roads and settlements that it shows are on this next map. And you can see the main roads are the turnpike roads from between Wolverhampton and Stourbridge going through King Swinford or Town's End at any rate, and Wordsley. The turnpike road that goes up what is now Brettle Lane through Briley Hill to Dudley, and the one that goes from King Swinford uh, through Shut End to Dudley as well. And also on the west of the map, the Kidderminster Wolverhampton Road through Prestwood and Wall Heath. So there was in 1822 a road system that's recognisably the same as the current road system, I think. But to fully understand the parish, we need to go back to the enclosure of about 50 years before. Ashwood Hay in the west of the parish was enclosed in 1776 and Pensnet Chase to the east of the parish was enclosed in 1784. The common fields in the centre of the parish were exchanged between landowners uh, in the late 17th century which, and they, that exchange was formalised in 1776. And in between them you've got a significant area of land between the enclosed areas. What the Fowler map does allow us to do though by looking at field orientations is to make some guess at what might, where, the, um, where the ancient fields of King Swinford might be by looking at the different orientations of fields in different places. For example, I think that area A there is a, the old Walheath Musgrave field. B is what was known as Old Field, King Swinford Field, or possibly Wartle Field. And C is Broad Field or Wordsley Field. D is an area of old estates, which again is actually quite important in appreciating the topography of the parish. These old estates were from the north to the south, the Shut End Estate, the Corbyn's Hall Estate, the Tiled House Estate, and the Bromley Hall Estate. And I think a respectable argument can be made that these go back a very long way to the 14th or the 15th century, uh, when these estates were gifted by the Earl of Dudley, the major landowner, to his feudal vassals. Uh, more on these estates later. Um, but we can see the field boundaries also allow, also give us a clue as to what the parish looks like. These are the field boundaries in the Corbyn's Hall estate that in 1822 were still very rural with ornamental pools around a large house. But some of the names of the fields that you see there, and I'm not going to go into them, 
in any great detail speak of a rural past. So we have withy pits, uh, we have pool tail piece, up, upper and lower long liso and so on, the paddock, ashen close, very much rural feet name, field names there. And similarly for the tiled house and Bromley house estates to the south of Corbin's Hall, where we have names like Upper and Lower Wars, uh, Upper Shorefield, Little Moorfield, and so on. So it gives us a clue as to what the parish was like in previous centuries. Having looked at the topography, what does the map and the book of reference tell us about the proprietors? Well, if you look at the proprietors, and I've plotted them there, I've tabulated them there, in term in order of the area that they held and the area i express in hectares here it's a bit easier to do than in acres um, and we can see that i in 1822 lord dudley was the primary landholder in 1842 in 1840 it was the trustees of the late earl uh, the second most important landholder was j a h foley and then there's a bit of variation in the order and i'll come and talk about these, some of these landowners and owners in a moment. But note the very large proportion held by the Earl of Dudley. And that's because he was the ancient lord of the manor and because an awful lot of the land at the enclosures went to him and to his estate. If we look at the various large houses in the parish, we can attach names to those large houses of the families who lived there. Shut End Hall at 1822 and Prestwood Hall, as we'll see, were both occupied by the Foley's. Corbyn's Hall by Gibbons, Tiled House by Mee, Bromley Hall by Homer, and other names there that I'm sure some listeners will be familiar with, Honeybourne in Moor Lane House, Adambrook at Bradley Hall. Let's think a bit more about some of these folk. In 1822, the Earl of Dudley was William Ward, to give him his full title, the eighth Baron Ward, the third Viscount Dudley and Ward. By 1840, the lands were held under trusteeship at the time uh, by William Ward, who was the 11th Baron Ward and was ultimately to become the first Earl of Dudley of the second creation and the first Viscount Etnam. During this period, they lived outside the parish at Himley Hall, but as I say, they owned large swathes of the parish, which they rented out to others, or which they developed themselves. The second major landholder was John Hodgetts Hodgetts Foley of Prestwood, 1797 to 1861. If a family can be measured by its success in climbing up the social ladder, then the Hodgetts family were extremely successful. In the 17th century, they were yeomen in the parish of King Swinford. But by judicious purchases of Corbyn's Hall in the first instance, when the Corbyn family died out, and marriages into the Bendy family, but through which they acquired Shut End Hall and also Holbeach Hall, or Beach Farm, and then into marriages into even bigger families, into the family of the Foley's, the Iron Master of Stourbridge, they became very, very major landholders. And there was some hesitation about what name they should use, and that hesitation is given beautifully in the name of John Hodgetts, Hodgetts Foley, J-A-H Foley as he appears. Um, at the time of the 1822 and 1840 maps, uh, they lived in Prestwood. They owned Shut End Hall, but actually leased it out and ultimately sold it, as we'll see. Uh, the son of John, a, John Hodgett Hodgett Foley, Paul Foley, uh, who doesn't enter into our story really, um, not only owned Prestwood, but also took over the rest of the Foley estate, estate at Stoke Edith in Worcestershire. I put him there because he was a noted county cricketer who played for Worcestershire and was indeed instrumental in getting Worcestershire accepted as a first-class county, which that sole 
qualification for being a very good bloke, in my view. Shut End Estate, as I said, was owned by John Foley. In 1822, it was occupied by Thomas Dudley of the Iron Masters of Tipton, and it was still very much a rural estate. By 1840, it was owned by James Foster, the industrialist, the Iron Master. He is perhaps best known for championing the King Swinford Railway into the area and for the Agenoria, the engine that ran along it and can still be seen in the National Railway Museum, a branch of the Science Museum. Um, he was one of the early industrial pioneers of the area. Other landholders are perhaps a bit surprising. Jonathan Stokes, 1755 to 1831. I didn't really know who he was, to be honest until I started looking him up. He was a member of the Lunar Society and I show their Soho House, uh, where the Lunar Society met. Not a major member, uh, but he actually did very groundbreaking work on the, um, on the analysis of digitalis and the effects of it on the human body. So quite an eminent scientist. He had a, a doctor's practice in Stourbridge and I guess at that time he acquired some of his lands in King Swinford. Corbin's Hall was owned by the Gibbons family, again, iron masters and coal masters who owned large swathes of land across the parish of King Swinford, particularly in the Briley Hill area, as well as Corbin's Hall. And there's Ben Gibbons in his old age, well after the maps were produced. At Oak Farm in the north of the parish, we have the Glynn family. And Oak Farm was ultimately owned by Stephen Glynn, a baronet, a noted antiquarian who basically his first home was a castle in North Wales. The Oak Farm area is famous for the Oak Farm ironworks that suffered a major financial crash that it took William Gladstone, a later Prime Minister, a considerable time to sort out. He was a brother-in-law, I believe, of Stephen Glynn. Richard Homer of Bromley Hall, he was a solicitor. The Homers were from Sedgley, a family again of yeomen who became coal masters and iron masters. Um, Richard Homer moved to Bromley Hall when the land around his former home in Sedgley uh, was degraded by mining and he promptly proceeded to do very much the same in, to the land around Bromley Hall. But there are one or two other interesting people as well or organisations. The Stourbridge Canal Company, of course. Stourbridge Canal uh, from the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal at Stoughton, uh, up past Stourbridge, through the Fens, round Briley Hill to where it joined the Dudley Canal. And this canal was a major, uh, major organisation, owned a lot of land in the parish. In 1840, a um, branch was built known as the Stourbridge Extension Canal, that went to the Oak Farm area and the two pictures at the bottom show the Stourbridge Extension Canal. Indeed, the picture at the bottom left, some people might be interested to know, shows Bromley Holt, a railway station that only existed for a very small number of years in the early 20th century. And then Richard Mee. Richard Mee owned, in some fashion, the Tiled House Estate. He is a subject of one of the most fascinating archivist entries in Dudley archives. You can sense the frustration of the archivist who wrote, a full description of the legal and equitable nightmare surrounding this estate between the 1790s and the 1840s is impossible. Many of the deeds are wanting. Suffice it to say that a mother buys in the life interest of her bankrupt son and in effect transfers it to his children but leaves other actual and potential interests to be inherited by those grandchildren and her other children. The actual estates taken are the subject of litigation, particularly in respect of her eldest grandchild, Richard Mee, like his father, who predeceases his father and leaves an infant daughter as his heir, whose husband eventually buys out most or all of the other interests and settles the outstanding charges on the accounts. Other bankruptcies, insolvencies, and imprisonments for debt, just muddy the waters. 
there's a story to be told there and I fear I simply don't have the energy to dig into it and tell it properly. A couple of other interesting uh, landowners, Horace St. Paul. Horace St. Paul was a Count of the Holy Roman Empire, perhaps the highest ranking aristoc aristocrat in the parish. He only held a few acres. He was married to a bastard child of the Earl of Dudley. And his father was a Northumbrian adventurer who fought in wars in Austria and was granted an aristocratic title there. Someone else that we'll be aware of, the Adam Brooks lived in the Kingswinford area. And of course, the most famous son of that family, although in many ways not the most successful, was uh, John Addenbrook of Cambridge, who founded the major hospital in the area. And there's a plaque for him on the wall of the chapel of St. Catherine's College, Cambridge. And here there's a personal connection because I walked by that plaque on my way to get married a long time ago. The proprietors, think briefly about the farms. There were a lot of farms in the early, at least in the 1822 map, scattered across the parish, primarily on the western side. And we can see some of them there. Uh, and that is largely because there was no coal there. That was a profitable way of using the land. The eastern side was the coal bearing area and the southern side around Wordsley was um, very rich, not just in coal, uh, but in clay and sand as well. And of course, that's why the glass industry grew up there. There seems to have been a move by the Dudley estate after enclosure to set up a lot of crofts and crofts are basically small farmsteads, two or three acres that they gave to individual land, individual occupiers. And I suspect this was really to begin to work the land, the unprofitable common land, and make it in some ways profitable. But I guess the area is mainly known for its industry, so we'll come on and think about that now, again, through the use of maps. The area was crisscrossed by railways and tramways. In 1822, we have the Starbridge Canal coming up from the south, uh, looping around Briley Hill, where it joined the Dudley Canal, uh, with a branch going off to the pools on the Fens, the pools we know today as the Fens, Middle and Grove Pools. Um, by 1840, that had been joined by the Starbridge Extension Canal, which went to Oak Farm in the north, and also by the King Swinford Railway, um, which went from the Staffordshire and Worcestershire Canal at the Ashwood Basin uh, through past King Swinford into the Corbyn's Hall area. And in the Corbyn's Hall area, you can see dotted lines there. There was a very significant tramway system. I'll say a little more about that later. Coal mines I've marked here. In 1822, most of the mines were in the Briar Hill area, um, which is where the original outcrops of coal were. By 1840, the mines in the Briar Hill area were beginning to be worked out and the mining activities had spread, in particular, to the north and the south there, always along the canal, of course. With the um, <laughs> movement of the mines, there was a growth of what's known in the, what's referred to in the directory as old cottery land and spoil, particularly again in the mine in the area around Briley Hill. In 1840, we're specifically told that some pits are ironstone pits, which were not in 1822. Again, these can be seen mainly in the Briley Hill area, although there are some around the shut end area. I suspect this means that the old coal mines were being exploited further for ironstone in some way. And there were of course ironworks and glassworks, some of these are very famous names I'm not going to go into, uh, but they're all situated along the canal and being along the canal of course is the way that their products can be moved. And again there was a development in the north of the parish between 1822 and 1840. Brickworks and clay pits. 
And here, in some ways, it's quite an interesting situation because it's a reverse. There were lots of small brickwork, small clay pits in 1822 that seem to have been consolidated to some extent by 1840. So there's a shrinkage in the number of sites there. Along with the development in industry, of course, there was the development of a society, a vibrant society in the parish. Lots of housing, all scattered between the industry. And what the Book of Reference enabled you to do, at least for the 1822 Book of Reference, is to look at the sizes of the houses. And if you look at those entries in the Book of Reference, just marked house, there's this double peak in the histogram. There's a, a small peak of only 0 0.006 hectares. Now, a hectare is a hundred meters square, a square of a hundred meters. So 0 0.006 is, I'll let you do the maths, not very big. <laughs> um, and then there is another peak at the uh, right of the graph, and that actually shows the larger houses of the aristocrats, the gentlemen of the parish. For the house and garden category, it's a much smoother distribution. Uh, the gar house and gardens were actually, even for the poorest people, quite large by our, our scale, as many people, of course, grew their own vegetables and indeed farmed their own pigs in the backyard. So the average size there of a house and garden plot was 0 0.04 hectares, 0.03 to 0 0.04 hectares. Churches and chapels developed, of course, what I show here, as well as the red blots of King Swinford, Wordsley and Briar Hill. The black squares show the Anglican places of worship and the uh, unfilled squares, the white squares, show the nonconformist places of worship. We can see that in 1822, there were a number of nonconformist chapels. Uh, there was also St Mary's, the ancient parish church, and Briley Hill Chapel was to become St Michael's Church. By 1840, the situation had changed somewhat. There were a plethora of nonconformist chapels of every type, every brand of Methodism, Baptist, Independent, and so on. And there were now four Anglican places of worship. Uh, the major development was at Holy Trinity Wordsley. Between the two maps, the situation at St Mary's had become quite desperate and people thought it was going to subside into the mines that had been dug very close to it. And so a new church was opened in Wordsley, the Church of Holy Trinity. St Mary's didn't actually fall into the mines and was later reopened. The other Anglican place of worship that opened was known as Pensnet Chapel. This isn't the current Pensnet Church of St Mark's, uh, but rather what became the first schoolroom in Bell Street. It was a, a function chapel for about 10 or 15 years before the church was built, a chapel of St Mary's and Holy Trinity. There were schools across the parish uh, and these uh, private schools to some degree. In the 1840s, we were beginning to get the beginnings of a national school system as well. Most of all, there were pubs, pubs all over the place. These served a number of functions. They're obvious meeting places, um, but they also, for example, were the headquarters of friendly societies uh, where people could pay some money in so that they would have some benefit if they were ill or if they required a pension. The books of reference also allow you to look at the names of people in the parishes. In total, there were 2,332 male names, but eight of them, uh, eight Christian names, make up 75% of the total. You could say they weren't that imaginative in their choice of names. Um, but then I guess neither are we. In female names, much fewer female names because the women don't tend to be named as occupiers to any great extent. But again, six names that we can see there make up 75% of the total. There are also a number of less common Old Testament names. Some of those names obviously are Old Testament names, but we also have a number of Lots, Labans, Ezra's, Ezekiel's. 
not in the Old Testament, but there was also one Hamlet in 1822. In terms of surnames, these were very widely spread, and the top 10 names make up only 15% of the total. Um, but again, I'm sure for those of you who know the families in the black country, there many of those names are still good, solid black country names. You can see my name appears there at the bottom, Baker. Uh, unfortunately, I am not related to any of those Bakers. I do come from the area, but my father's family actually ultimately comes from Litchfield. And my mother's family, who are also Bakers, actually comes mainly from the Dudley area. So now let's go on to think about the individual townships and show a few extracts from the maps. What I've produced in the book King Swinford Manor and Parish are discussions of each of those six areas. Now I thought it would be very tedious to go through the six one by one so I've just chosen three and no doubt in choosing three I will disappoint some of my listeners. I've chosen King Swinford, Wordsley and Shut End and Pensnet. King Swinford because it was the ancient centre, Wordsley because it was a well-developed industrial area, Shut End and Pensnet because it was an area that developed significantly between 1822 and 1840 and it's also because that's where I was born and brought up so if you like it's author's privilege. King Swinford in 1822 and there you can see the map. You can see the road, uh, remember north now is to the top right. We can see first of all King Swinford Church there, St Mary's, and the Dudley King Swinford Road going through it, uh, going through the crossroads at the cross that was known as Town's End um, and that's on the Wolverhampton Stourbridge Road and we can also see if we follow that through there's Bradley Hall there and there's Summerhill House there and we can see the Dawley Brook running to the north of King Swinford Church there and you can see it's a very very rural situation very agrarian situation if we look at it in 1840, then there's been a bit more urbanism in some ways, um, in that there's now uh, more housing along the road. Um, and, but the major change is that the King Swinford Railway that has actually now come from Ashwood Basin and on its way to, um, to um, Corbin's Hall, and you can see that pass surprisingly close to King Swinford Church. Those of you who know the area, that's sort of the top end of King Swinford Park these days, I think. Um, and at that point, where I've just marked with a red dot, were the mines that gave St Mary's Church so much hassle in the 1820s and 1830s. If we come on now to Wordsley in 1822, in 1822, Wordsley was already a well-established urban centre, extending from Wordsley Green in the north through to Orton and Bank in the south. And uh, as we go down the road, we have a non-conformist meeting house and the glassworks, Bradley, Ensel and Holt, Gray's Book, uh, Pitcock, Cope and Co. All those were the names they had in those days. They changed over the years, of course. Um, and we can see the Stourbridge Canal running past Bradley, Ensel and Holt. Uh, and again, mixed up with the industry, we can see a fairly rural environment. What's not shown on the map, it's to the top right, is the workhouse um, uh, that became the Stourbridge Union workhouse, just off the top of the picture there. But also what I've not shown, because it just got too complicated, were the pubs from top to bottom, from Wordsley Green to Orton and Bank, the New Inn, the Cat, the Wheat Chief, Cottage of Content, Rose and Crown, Duke of Wellington, King's Head, Marquis of Granby and the Turk's Head. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine pubs, one place of religion. I think that possibly says something about the priorities of the good folk of Wordsley in 1822. By 1840, in some ways, not much had changed. The big change had been 
the church, Holy Trinity Church, had been built, along with the associated rectory, or in the directory, the rectory and pleasure grounds, and a school too. Uh, the village continued to develop. Coming on now to the Pensnet and Shot End area, in 1822 this was still quite rural. We have the Shot End House, which was where Ben Gibbons lived. It was a 17th century house, um, quite a, a spacious one. I suspect some of my listeners, older listeners, will remember it as the house known as the Plantation, uh, which has only been knocked down in recent years, I believe. Um, Shot End House, Corbin's Hall in 1822, still a fairly grand place. Um, and in this was again owned by the Gibbons family and one of the Gibbons lived in it and you can see to the top right and just below the house some of the ornamental pools. There are, if you look very closely there, just the first traces of coal mines in the area. So Corbin to all to the south we have the tiled house, the house that first comes into the historical record through John Hayden who made steel there by very odd processes that I don't think historians really understand terribly well. Tansy Green in the north, um, a small, small settlement, could equally well call it Shut End. Uh, houses around the common side area. Um, common side, of course, by its very name, marks the edge of the 1784 Pensnet Chase enclosure. Uh, the, it was at the side of the common. Um, Barrow Hill Coppice, home by the Earl of Dudley, and at the bottom we have the canal feeder pools, the fence pool, the middle pool and the grove pool. If we look at those pools these days we think of them as a major stable feature of the landscape. In fact their shape has changed very significantly over the years. And in particular, the middle pool in the 1880s uh, almost dried up completely. Um, so they're perhaps not as permanent as we might first think, but they were the feeder pools for the Stourbridge Canal. But still largely rural. 1840, things had changed. Corby Hall is still there, but so is Corbin's Hall Furnaces, Corbin's Hall Old Ironworks. Uh, and there have been lots of mining activity in the area uh, around the ironworks. The Stourbridge Extension Canal had been built with a branch into Corbin's Hall. The King Swinford Railway had entered the area from the top, and on the King Swinford Rail from the King Swinford Railway, there are a variety of tramways of different sorts uh, that now existed in the area. Um, some going to the King Smithford Railway, some going down to the canal. Um, one particular, oh, and in the bottom left-hand corner, we have what might be called the first Pensnet, bottom right-hand corner, I do apologise, might be called the first Pensnet in the Bell Street Hollies Farm area, um, where houses were being built for the mining families in the area to supplement those in Common Side uh, and in Bromley. So there we perhaps have the first Pensnet um, and uh, there are also a number of non-conformist chapels scattered around the area. The red dot that I've just shown at that point there is where one of the old tramways crosses beneath Bromley and I make I show that particularly because I think that is potentially a site of archaeological interest. The tramway was from Corbin's Hall down to the Fens branch of the canal and it was basically an incline at a fairly standard gradient and it went several metres beneath Bromley so there would have been a tunnel beneath Bromley. I suspect that over the years knowing how roads were built and maintained uh, roads were simply built over what already existed. I suspect that beneath there 
there might still be the remains of an ancient industrial tramway. It might be an archaeological site there. So if anyone ever sees them digging up the road at that point, it might be worth having a quick look. So the Fowler maps of King's Winford, I hope that's been of interest. An ongoing resource, I would suggest, for land ownership, for looking at social development, industrial development, but particularly, I think, for looking at family history. There is a huge amount of information available in the book of reference. As I mentioned, I have transcribed both books of reference. It took not some, it took a little while, I have to say. Uh, and they're now available from me for anyone who wishes as Excel spreadsheets. And it may be that these are very useful for people doing family history whose family comes from that area. As I said, this material was taken from the ebook King Swinford Manor and Parish. You can get copies of that ebook by emailing me on c.j.baker at bm.ac.uk. And there is more information at my website, uh, which is given, the URL is given there. You can simply Google it if you haven't got time to take it down. Thank you for listening, ladies and gentlemen.